Well, hello everybody. Let me welcome you all in uh, this uh, International uh, Lepid Summit, uh, one of the virtual CME activities of IAVA Board. Uh, um, uh, tonight, let me welcome uh, uh, our dear friend, uh, Dr. Uh, Andreas Zarlik from uh, Graz, uh, Austria. Um, he is a, a, a dear friend of all of us. Um, we hope that uh, we can uh, See you again, Andrea, in a non-virtual meeting like with the one in the picture here. Uh, if you remember, this is the last cardio risk that was in Hergada last, uh, last year. Uh, also, I would like to uh, uh, welcome Dr. Uh, Dreg van Levinsky from Graz uh, University. Uh, Dr. Dirk, welcome you with uh, our virtual activities. Um, I will leave the uh, uh, mic to uh, Dr. Atf al-Bahari to introduce uh, the faculty and the agenda of the meeting and i hope all of you will enjoy uh, our virtual cme uh, activities of tonight Dr. thank you ashraf it's a great pleasure and honor to moderate uh, such a wealthy event libid summit i should thank uh, my dear friend the professor andrea zelik uh, and professor derek von levineski for accepting our invitation uh, to enrich uh, the summit with their experience and sharing uh, it with a magnificent Egyptian uh, faculty of experts, and they are well-known pillars in cardiovascular medicine. Uh, our agenda here, we have three lectures. Every lecture shall be followed by discussion and answering questions. And the first lecture is uh, presented by my dear friend, Professor Andrea Zerlik, the president of the German Society of Atherosclerosis and the chairman of the cardiology department of Medical University of Graz, Austria. The, and the and second one will be presented by Dr. Ashraf Reda, president of IAVA and the professor of cardiology in Mufeya uh, Medical School. And the third lecture with uh, our uh, dear friend, Professor Derek von, von Rivineski, head of research unit in myocardial uh, energetics and metabolism in the, at Medical University of Graz II in Austria. So we start now with uh, our dear uh, Andrea, the inflammatory theory of acid sclerosis. Yeah, thank you, Ate, for this uh, very kind uh, introduction. I'm also very honored to be here and uh, to give this very first presentation. Let's see, can everyone see my slides? I, I think I have to sh to stop sharing my uh, mind. Uh, yes, I, yes, I, yes, it's okay. We can see them well. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Excellent. I apologize for the rescaling. This was just done um, five minutes uh, before the presentation, so probably we will have uh, some slides not in perfect shape, but I hope everyone can see it clearly. Yeah, so many of you know me already, and my longtime passion has been the exploration of inflamm inflammatory pathways in atherosclerosis, and um, very much due to my training in Boston many years ago. So, um, uh, uh, we know for a while now already, actually for a couple of decades, that inflammatory mechanisms play a very important role in a variety of different diseases. And this also very much pertains uh, to atherosclerosis and its associated sequelae, um, such as myocardial infarction, and uh, in general, the cardiovascular risk very much determined by uh, inflammatory level in our patients. Now, what you see here are recordings obtained in experimental models. Um, in urine models, uh, up here you see the bloodstream of a living vessel in a mouse uh, that got inflammatory activated by TNF-alpha. And what you can appreciate is that inflammatory cells that uh, a lot of them move quickly, but some of them start rolling and start to extravasate into the tissue. This is how we think the initial steps um, of a plaque formation are actually determined. Later on in this process, this whole process is fostered by a specific immune response. And this is another intravital image here, a film obtained in a mouse where you can actually see T cells that are specific for some residues of LDL, of ApoB, um, uh, and are actually in contract with antigen-presenting cells, in that case, a dendritic cell, um, 
this specific immune response uh, in later stages then really sort of perpetuates uh, uh, this inflammatory process. And what we know is that uh, the more inflammatory nature of, uh, uh, of uh, plaques we have, the more complications we encounter. Now, for many years, there has been this big debate. Uh, is it classical risk factors such as LDL or is it inflammation? And there were two opposing leagues uh, claiming uh, either. Uh, actually, I would like to uh, guide you more into a view that there is no contradiction. What we know is we have a vascular inflammation in the vessels, all of us do, and the degree determines uh, uh, finally uh, uh, sort of secondary complications, but the upstream patterns of risk may be very different, and you may encounter those that have a particular lipid burden, you may encounter those that have uh, a cigarette smoking as a key risk factor, you may encounter those with diabetes, and you may encounter those that have other sources of inflammation um, in the body, triggering the inflammation in the vascular wall. Susie, what the is internet actually is unstable. Can you all check if it's okay or not? I just lost the sound. Uh, do you hear me? No, yes, yes. Yes, we hear you well. I okay. think the problem is with uh, Hannah's uh, laptop. Yes, we have. Okay. So, in the but what is what is common in all those patients is that finally, sort of the, the the biological process in the vessel will be an inflammatory process that will lead to cardiovascular events. This uh, this drawing is also very much the basis. Yes, please. Of of a very uh, of a very personalized uh, uh, risk assessment approach and then therapeutic approach, but I will come to that later. The other striking link between inflammation and atherosclerosis is the fact that we see sure. almost any inflammatory condition in our body um, predisposes for atherosclerosis. Most commonly, we know this for rheumatoid arthritis. You have about a twofold risk. Uh, for atherosclerotic events, but it's also true for gout, for cerebral arthritis, for lupus, uh, virtually actually for any inflammatory process that happens in our body. Now, high sensitive CRP has been suggested as a good marker. It has been tested in various uh, collectives and uh, has shown strong, uh, strong indications as a marker of risk, even in those very well lipid controlled. This is a subgroup anal analysis of one of the big PCSK9 trials uh, that shows you even in those that had levels of uh, 20 to 50 uh, milligram per deciliter LDL, you still had a predictive value of the residual inflammatory risk. So it's independent of the classic pathway, but it really shows you it is uh, 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 high sensitive CRP predicts uh, risk. Whether high sensitive CRP on the long term will be the marker of our choice or whether we will have more uh, apt uh, parameters, uh, this is also a point I think we can return to later on and particularly in the discussion. Last year, we published a little cohort study where we included virtually all comers of our cardiovascular department, uh, around 900 patients with chronic coronary syndrome. And obviously we extensively characterized them for classical risk factors as well as LDL and high sensitive CAP. And what we observed in the overall collective, we observed an HSC appear greater than two in about 40%. In those, and this study was done when we still had a, a different target for our lipid levels. We will hear more about this from uh, uh, from Dirk uh, in the next in the in the in the last presentation. Um, we observed that even those controlled, still about thirty percent of those people had an increased high sensitive CFP. What were the baseline characteristics associated with this? Uh, if you look on the right-hand side, here is the multivariate analysis, and it was really those having a high lipoprotein A that had significantly increased levels, those smoking, those with an increased or drastically increased body mass index, and, uh, and this may be a reflection of the need for intensified uh, therapy and thereby indirectly suggesting people at more risk, uh, those receiving ezetimibe. 
Now, over the last uh, three, four years, we've seen a couple of first studies that, uh, apart from the biological concept and the biological data, interrogated clinical collectives uh, to see whether an anti-inflammatory therapy actually results in the reduction of cardiovascular events. And one very central structure of our body for as far as inflammation response is concerned is the so-called inflammasome. The inflammasome is activated by a variety of different processes involved in atherogenesis and uh, virtually transforms pro-interleukin-1 beta into active interleukin-1 beta, then triggering a whole downstream pathway of inflammation also reflected in an increased uh, CFP. Now, in 2017, the first study ever looking into this pathway clinically was the CANTOS trial, uh, uh, where an antibody against interleukin-1 beta, as you all know and are aware of, canakinabap was given and showed uh, modulation of heart endpoints, as in MACE, uh, in the overall collective that was particularly profound in uh, about half of the collective that normalized its HSCAP levels uh, after the first dosing. In this part, in this subgroup, we even observed a 30% total mortality reduction. Not so much surprisingly from my initial uh, remarks, it also showed that it modulated a variety of other, uh, uh, of other diseases, including most prominently the incidence of cancer. And uh, this is fortunate and, and unfortunate for the cardiovascular field because the company, after that, given the very pronounced reductions in the incidence of cancer, um, um, decided, and many say based on a marketing approach, um, um, to pursue this very drug in the cancer league. This is why there have been a number of articles, also this appearing on the TCT webpage at, in 2000. Uh, 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 19, um, suggesting uh, there may be some people ask if marketing trumpeted medicine here. Uh, meanwhile, we saw a couple of other studies. So most prominently, um, methotrexate was tested based on some findings that people receiving methotrexate for rheumatoid arthritis have lower incidence of myocardial infarction. Uh, in an overall collective, however, of high-risk patients, uh, at least uh, four weeks uh, after a myocardial infarction, this very drug regimen did not do anything at all in terms of modulation of heart endpoints. Leaving the question, is it a too general uh, inhibition of inflammation? Do we need a specific uh, 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 interference, for example, with the inflammasome pathway as we have uh, seen in CANTOS? Uh, some data we get from another substance, colchicin. Um, colchicin is known to be, to, to be involved in treatment of gout for decades and um, more recently has been very, very successful in treating pericarditis. Now, we all know colchicin as a tubulin uh, um, uh, agent that is anti-proliferative. Uh, what we know, know less, or most people know less about, is it's also a very powerful inhibitor of the very NLRP3 inflammasome that generates interleukin-1 beta. There's been a very small study uh, already early on published in 2013, the so-called low do -co trial, um, that demonstrated in a small collective of only slightly above 500 patients a remarkable decrease in cardiovascular events, in heart cardiovascular events, including myocardial infarction, um, uh, leaving, of course, always some doubts. Uh, how can it be so powerful in a small collective? And, of course, leading to a big trial, uh, actually a series of big trials, the first of which uh, was uh, presented at AHA last year, the Colcott trial uh, and published in the New England Journal at this very same uh, at the very same time. Uh, we looked at about five thousand patients here post myocardial infarction within thirty days after myocardial infarction on a steady standard regimen, and they were randomized to the low dose of colchicin of 0.5 milligram daily or placebo, and then screened for heart endpoints with a mean follow up of about twenty two months. Now. 
If you look at the patient characteristics, it's a standard collective, as we've seen in Cantos too, but 30% smokers, hypertension, diabetes prevalent in one fifth, and uh, quite of them had already prior events or even PCI or surgery. And they were all on a remarkable regimen with 98% receiving aspirin, 98% other antiplatelet agents, uh, statins very well penetrated with 99%, and also beta blocker prevalent in this uh, very um, cohort. Now, if we look at the primary efficacy endpoint, which is a standard combined endpoint of CV death, resuscitated cardiac arrest, MI, stroke, urgent hospitalization for angina requiring revascularization, there was after a median follow-up again of about 22 months, so not a very long time, at overall 23% reduction, significant reduction in this endpoint. If you look at the individual endpoints, uh, what you see is the most marked effect actually on urgent hospitalization for angina requiring revascularization. Whereas formerly uh, here, there was only a trend in terms of CV death that uh, had a very wide margin of uh, standard error, so did not become significant. Now, you may wonder, Colchicin, of course, is known to cause some side effects. However, in this low dose regimen, it hardly did. Um, uh, you see the overall numbers are very promising. 1.0% uh, nausea in the placebo group, 1.8 in the colchicine group, a little bit of flatulence, some pneumonia, but unlike in the Cantor's trial, we did not see any signal for septic shock or even septic shock associated death. So very well tolerated and promising data. There are a couple of other big trials we are eagerly awaiting in this uh, context. The CLEAR Synergy trial, also about 4,500 patients, I think, interrogating peristemi. Um, um, and there is Colcot True already uh, uh, sort of uh, running uh, that looks in a high risk collective for colchicin as primary prevention. It's a diabetes, type 2 diabetes uh, collective. So I think we will see much more of this very broad substance. Again, whether this is the key to all questions, I do not believe so, but I will pre uh, present you some more perspectives at the end of this talk. Now, what does this mean for our clinical understanding of disease and particularly for risk stratification and therapy? I think we've been in an absolutely enticing era where we've seen like a real, uh, I call it here, silent revolution of the drugs within the last five, six years. Um, because if you would have asked me before, like uh, five, six years ago, I would have said we are already very good in secondary prevention, but we really saw a, a big change within this time. Uh, we have new anti-inflammatory concepts. We definitely have very, very valid and powerful anti-lipid strategies, um, as we will hear more about uh, uh, later on in this meeting. Anti, new antithrombotic regimens with combined uh, antiplatelet and uh, anticoagulation concepts, the new anti-diabetic drugs and new heart failure drugs. So we've really seen a lot, but who should we give what? And this is, I think, the biggest question and challenge for the next uh, decade of cardiovascular medicine to identify the right patient for the right treatment. Now, I think we need a lot of more data to do so, but I think there are a couple of aspects that we can be sure about even today. Which patients profit most as of today? And I think there are two principles. The first big principle is the higher your risk, the more you benefit. And I think this is very important, particularly when it comes to cost-sensitive therapies. We've seen this in the PCSK9, tri uh, PCSK9 trials, like here in the Fourier trial, uh, stratification for easy parameters such as multivessel disease or single vessel disease clearly shows you that you have a much higher absolute risk reduction in those with a multivessel disease. And you can play this through with many other parameters, immediately resulting in a much lower number needed to treat uh, to actually save one patient from an event. You also see this very clearly in the Odyssey trial. For example, here just stratifying for one bad disease, two vascular bad disease, or three vascular bad disease. So for example, peripheral, carotid, and uh, 
uh, a coronary artery disease. Again, you see a marked reduction in the highest risk group and therefore a much, much lower, uh, a much, much lower um, a number needed to treat. This is also apparent in new strategies like the COMPASS regimen in stable coronary artery disease. In the overall collective, about 1.3% absolute risk reduction. If you go up further here and combine uh, CAD and PAD, for example, together, you can markedly increase that and, and thereby decrease the number needed to treat in your patient collective. So the more risk, the more benefit. The other really sort of principle we should keep in mind when treating our patients is that earlier is usually better. And uh, uh, one study that really pointed this out very nicely early on, uh, also last year in the ESC presented, uh, was this uh, study from the Biobank in uh, Great Britain, uh, interrogating um, uh, variations in your genetic signature that come with different levels of LDL and blood pressure. And if you see, if you just have a lifelong lowering of blood pressure by your genetic pool, uh, by three milligram per deciliter, you already reduce about 20% your overall lifetime cardiovascular risk. If you go 15 milligram per deciliter lifelong reduction in LDL, you have a 30% reduction, both together 40%. And if you're very lucky and you, have, and you have a genetic pool that comes with a 10% lowering lifelong of your blood pressure and 40 milligram per deciliter LDL, you virtually don't encounter disease at all anymore. It's reduced by 80%. So this is very promising data that also shows us the ways uh, that we need much more personalization in medicine. Now, for the very high risk uh, collective in secondary prevention, for me, this means we have very, uh, we have very consequent strategies, probably combining uh, uh, antiplatelet and anticoagulant therapy with a high dose statin, statin, acetamide strategy in diabetes early on combination even of the new therapies, then stringent LDL therapy. And I'm sure within the next couple of years, we will have a standard uh, uh, probably starting with colchicin and then moving to more specific uh, strategies in curbing residual and uh, inflammatory risk. Now, what is coming on the horizon in the future? I think we have to leave the concept uh, to just, you know, inhibit cytokines. Um, uh, we also have to leave the concept in relying on cytokines as biomarkers. I think the future really lies in appreciating the diversity of uh, our, the cellular diversity of our immune system, because in the end, it's the immune cells that link different tissue depots uh, with sort of target organs of disease. And um, we've known uh, now, we've appreciated over a couple of years now, in mouse models that the immune system plays a pivotal role. I showed you this picture before in the very beginning of this T cell interacting with uh, antigen presenting cells in mice. Actually, what you can clearly see is that mice developing atherosclerosis, these are the APOE mice versus the normal white type mice. Over a, a, a time of an atherogenic di diet, they actually develop, uh, accumulate a, a lot of memory cells, T, uh, effector memory cells, uh, and uh, uh, and you can also see this here in the large increase in spleen size and in the draining lymph nodes. And what we start to appreciate is that we probably are already born or early on in early age develop sort of T cells that recognize uh, residues, pro-atherogenic residues, uh, but for a long time, they are actually protective T cells. So they wean down the inflammatory response. And then over the course of time, something happens, a switch. They suddenly proliferate and become very aggressive T cells. So the whole challenge will be therapeutically to keep by, for example, tolerant vaccination strategies, uh, sort of our immunity more to the tolerant side. And I think we will see a marked decrease in atherosclerosis. Strategies or methods that will help us a lot in this are modern multiplex techniques such as single cell RNA sequencing, where you can actually, you know, differentiate leukocyte subsets much better and with a much higher resolution based on their expression profile uh, than you can currently, for example, with FACS techniques. And this is 
One example, which is recently published uh, in, in mouse again, which just shows you here like uh, a Tisney plot. So plots where expression of the cells, whenever they are close together, they are close in expression. When they are further away, they differentiate in their gene expression. And what you can see, a wild type mouse has much less diversity than a mouse actually developing atherosclerosis. So we have to uncode some of those, uh, uh, the meaning of some of those cells, and then we will become much more uh, uh, much more specific in our therapeutic response. This is also a great chance to identify new biomarkers that there is promise there, show, show you already uh, older studies, just facts based with limited markers. For example, here monocytes, there are different monocyte groups, classical monocytes, and here intermediate monocytes. And these intermediate monocytes have been shown before here in a collective of about 1,000 patients that uh, uh, the more of those you have, uh, uh, the lower is your event-free survival. I think this will be uh, a very nice specific biomarker for the future if you continue exploring it with more sensitive techniques, such as uh, single cell RNA sequencing. And we are investing a lot of efforts and I cannot present you the data yet because it's not published, but hopefully the next time in our OFAS meeting, I can show you some very exciting data that it actually works in patients. Yeah, with that, I would like to thank my team. I would like to thank you. Um, and I leave you with some very nice pictures of our lovely star and setting. Uh, some of you have already had the opportunity to visit us and I encourage you all to do so. And I'm open for questions. Thank you, Arte. Mm -hmm. Thank, you, so Thank you very much, uh, dear Andrea. And uh, now we start uh, the discussion. Yes, Dr. Atif. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Andrea, for your great presentation. Um, I am Nabil Farag, uh, and, and I would like to ask you a, a couple of questions. But I would like to uh, just uh, uh, to say a very small comment uh, that when we go back to the statin trial, um, um, one statin is superior to the other statin mainly due to its effect on the high sensitivity troponin. And I think um, uh, we were speaking or are speaking now about the uh, high intensity statin like rosuvastatin and atorvastatin. And these are the main statins who have uh, showed uh, effect on high sensitivity uh, C-reactive protein that they have as well as uh, anti-inflammatory effect in addition to the strong lipid lowering uh, effect. And I think this may put an advantage of these statins over the other statins. Uh, my question for you, um, 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 your opinion about um, uh, the triggering of the process of atherosclerosis, which is more important? The, uh, the inflammation or the lipids, the LDL or oxidized LDL cholesterol? Yeah, so first of all, I'd like to appreciate your comment. I mean, the, the, the speculation or actually, there, there's been a lot of basic data for statins uh, being anti-inflammatory. And the speculation has been out there for a long time, particularly following the Jupiter trial, for those who remember the, the, the it, uh, people that were out of the streets with, uh, at that time, considered normal lipid levels and randomized to uh, rosuvastatin, um, they really showed a nice reduction in HSCFB and actually a benefit in terms of total mortality. So I think statins are very powerful agents, and you're absolutely right. There is a reason why we recommend our novel strategies, such as PCSK9 inhibitors, on top of statins once we don't reach treatment goals. I think it's a very important point. Um, it, it, only in those really severely intolerant, I would uh, go to a strategy of, uh, of, of just prescribing a PCSK9 inhibitor. We should always aim on a combination therapy. Uh, yeah, I think in terms of inflammation and LDLR, uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, of course, there is no final answer, but I presented you my concept and I think there is a lot of data uh, supporting it that um, uh, the triggers uh, that inflammation in the vet, it's important to, to talk about, it's important to know which inflammation we are talking about. Now, inflammation in the vessel wall is certainly disease relevant and will, will 
uh, will uh, determine consequences and complications. Um, uh, but it can be triggered by various factors, and LDL is a very strong factor for that. Um, if we are talking about inflammation in other subsets, uh, or for example, in your adipo visceral adipose tissue or in your joints, then this is like a non-traditional factor also upstream of this very vessel inflammation. Uh, thereby saying it, I think it really boils down to evaluating where is the highest risk in your patient and this is your primary treatment target. So in someone with very high LDL levels, the primary treatment target is reducing LDL. And then if you still measure residual inflammation, please, hopefully we will soon go ahead um, and have a specific agent, or um, for now, try to increase even further the statin dose. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, my second question for you um, uh, regarding the LDL and the inflammatory marker like high sensitivity C-reactive protein. Mm -hmm. um, um, as you said, that um, um, oxidized LDL may initiate uh, some inflammatory response, and this may lead to the process of acidosis. So my question is regarding this point is that if we have a patient with a very low LDL cholesterol, like those uh, who used to see in Poirier and Odyssey trial, that they achieved an LDL of 25 or even below 25, mm -hmm. do you think that there is still residual uh, risk factor for the development of atherosclerosis in these patients due to uh, in some inflammation or some increase in inflammatory markers like uh, high sensitivity C-reactive protein. Mm -hmm. So if you remember this one graph that I showed about the subgroup analysis, uh, I think it was the, uh, it was one of the big PCSK9 trials. Uh, 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 it, there is still risk prediction. Of course, in the general population, reducing LDL down to levels of 20, uh, 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 this risk will be on an absolute scale, probably um, uh, not very pronounced. But there are patients that have very low LDL levels and have high inflammatory sources in their body and are still developing these events. And I'm sure you've met patients where you say, well, we are perfectly controlled, at least uh, to our current knowledge, uh, with the LDL and we still have an inflammatory potential. Also, what's always really worth looking is, even if LDL is low, what's your lipoprotein A doing? Because lipoprotein A is a, a very pronounced risk factor. I know we don't have a very stringent, or we don't have yet, as of yet, a specific uh, therapeutic means to reduce it. Um, but, um, so the only guidance we currently issue is reduce LDL as much as possible. Uh, but what we do know is that LDL, LP little a uh, molecules are particularly inflammatory. So uh, this may also be in a, a, a collective where an anti-inflammatory approach is actually very promising. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, Professor Andreas. This is Dr. Said Farag, another Farag after Nabil Farag. <laughs> <Hi. laughs> uh, nice to see you. And also, we have a great pleasure. We have a great honor to have you with us today. And we have also Professor Derek. Uh, it, uh, actually, it is a very lovely presentation. I, I really enjoy it. Uh, and I'd like to uh, ask you the one of the burning questions. I think a lot of us is... Uh, uh, had this uh, this question, which is the issue of the inflammation, the issue of the effect of various drugs on the inflammations, because as you showed us elegantly, the uh, we have the efficacy of uh, colchicine, we have the efficacy of canicunam approved, but why not we have the efficacy of methotrexate? Mm. Uh, they are all inflammation. I know this is the start of the story, but it is not. It seems it is not the same story. I'd like to hear your comment, please, Professor Andreas. Mm. Yeah, I think, first of all, we have to consider that inflammation is not inflammation. And we've, uh, we've appreciated this in a variety of studies. For example, also in the COX inhibiting studies uh, that actually came with an increase with a small, albeit increased uh, uh, signal for, um, for myocardial infarction and actually led to the withdrawal of some drugs or the, the markedly reduced prescription of these drugs. First of all, we have to appreciate that uh, inflammation may be bad, but may also be good. 
And uh, if you remember, I showed you these, uh, this slide about inflammatory cells that may induce, may be protective, but others with a more uh, a typical, um, uh, very pro-inflammatory signature may be actually detrimental. And we need to understand more about this balance and which drugs influence this to a balance. And there is quite some data that actually shows that the interference with the inflammasome pathway uh, may benefit uh, towards this uh, more protective uh, 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 inflammatory cell source. This is why I believe ultimately we shouldn't think so much about general agents that somehow suppress inflammation, but we should think more about how to not inhibit, but modulate our immune response. Mm -hmm. I think uh, because of time, Art, if you can... Uh... This is still a way ahead. <laughs> we still have time. Ashraf, don't be hurry, because uh, Said have an important question too. Huh? Mm. Uh, uh, again, we have a, a long list of biomarkers for mm -hmm. inflammations. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, used some of them practically, and we cannot use a lot of them practically. Uh, the, the most one we use is the high-sensitive C-reactive protein, as you showed us. Mm -hmm. But if we dive through the, um, the clinical evidences, we found that uh, it is, yes, it is sensitive, but it is naturally specific. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about this point and what do you think which will come out from this long list to be practically used as the biomarker? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for sure you're right that high sensitive CAP has the most evidence, and this is why uh, why why we propagate using it. Um, again, I think looking at biomarkers, at uh, soluble biomarkers alone, is not very or will on in the long term not be the best and promising approach because what you measure is a surrogate of inflammation wherever it happens in your body. You have no clue whether this is the inflammation related to your vascular wall inflammation, whether this is the inflammation coming from some joint problems in rheumatoid, whether this is the inflammation coming from obesity and from your visceral adipose tissue. My speculation, by the way, is that in most of the studies, what we measure is probably a lot is related to obesity and uh, visceral adipose inflammation because I'm not entirely convinced that your vessels generate enough in this low level inflammation in the vessels is enough to really give you a very big signal in your high sensitive CFP. Um, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm again much more convinced and uh, uh, what I can tell you, we, 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 we currently did a first pilot study with single cell RNA sequencing uh, here in Graz, interrogating a collective of patients that have um, um, that have medium level atherosclerosis and medium Jensini score. Um, and uh, we only could do small numbers because it's a highly costly uh, technique. Currently, one sample about 3,000 euros, which is insane. Um, so we did a very small collective, but even in this small collective, we could see a significant difference between a group uh, that, after a coronary angiography with medium stenosis, developed an event within three years and another group that was event three for 15 years. So, um, uh, uh, so I believe actually that the future is more in looking very defined specific cell types that may, uh, and this also makes sense because you know what could really happen nicely, for example, in an obese collective is that you have inflammatory cells, they are primed in your adipose tissue, move then to the compartment of your vessels and actually initiate more inflammation there um, or are activated by an altered microenvironment. So, uh, but uh, uh, if, if you think about it, the link of the immune system between bone marrow, spleen, liver, between uh, different uh, tissues and reservoirs like your adipose tissue and the vessels makes a lot of sense. And I'm sure we will find much more specific uh, uh, information out of that than just measuring a soluble biomarker that can come from anywhere. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, and uh, I have uh, a very short question, and I need a short uh, answer. Oh, Does relief yes, from risk factors? Does relief from risk factors deactivate the inflammatory process, or other inflammatory mediators are independent of? 
So I definitely believe that if you cut down in your, uh, I definitely believe if you cut down uh, dr drastically in your risk factors, it will relieve your burden of inflammation substantially. Um, particularly, it will influence the vessel wall inflammation. Not ever, not all modulation of all risk factors will, however, influence, you know, uh, inflammatory sources that arise from a different disease process. So if you have a rheumatoid arthritis, probably a, a high dose lipid therapy will not relieve you of the inflammatory signal, uh, but it will definitely relieve your vessels of some of the inflammatory burden. Thank you, Andrea. I appreciate it. And now we turn it to the second lecture. First of all, that's Alfredo. It is not only LDL cholesterol, rule of triglyceride, rich lipoproteins. Thank you, uh, Atif. Uh, I'm ready, Ahmed. Okay, thank you for the faculty and thank you, Atif. And uh, uh, now um, I think uh, after the uh, uh, presentation of uh, Dr. Andrea about the inflammation, uh, I want to tell you another uh, issue uh, that it is not only the LDL. There is many other, even in the lipid uh, uh, profile, in the lipid in the pathology of lipid particles, uh, we have what we called the triglyceride rich lipoprotein and i will tell you why uh, they are very uh, important uh, um, I, I like these slides because it uh, represent the the magnitude of the residual risk in the major statin trials since uh, uh, since the early 80s till 2002 maybe later uh, for s studies and the others uh, all of them shows uh, impressive reduction of event rate from the patients who are or not on a statin to patient with the statin therapy. But if you look at the, these columns, uh, even after reduction of the event rate, we still have these blue columns representing the residual event rate that happened to the patients, even they are still on statin therapy. This residual risk can be explained, of course, by the inflammation that Dr. Andrea was referring for in his uh, excellent presentation. But I wanted to now in this presentation to press on the lipid part as the cause of the residual risk. We have a lot to do uh, uh, regarding the lipid uh, uh, therapy to trying to reduce this residual risk. For example, more lowering of the goals, and we know that the recent uh, ACS guidelines is now telling us 55 milligram in very high risk and maybe 40 milligram in those with repeated recurrent uh, attacks. Uh, maybe the concept of starting lipid lowering uh, uh, therapy earlier in our life, rather than wait till we have a risk high, very high risk score. Uh, we have to predict those we are liable for atherosclerosis and start lipid lowering earlier. Uh, the the issue of today is the triglyceride and non-HDL issue and triglyceride rich lipoprotein. Of course, all of you know that uh, uh, the lipoprotein in our body. Uh, are heterogeneous. Uh, we have uh, uh, many uh, atherogenic lipoprotein. It is not only the LDL that is atherogenic in our body. The HDL is the only protective one 
uh, that's why uh, uh, estimation or evaluation of the non-HDL particle uh, is important because it is not only LDL, we have very low density, we have chylomicron, and we have others. Let us look at this uh, 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 metabolic pathway of the lipid in, the, in our body. Uh, you know, uh, the HDL is formed at the nascent or disc form. For, there is some interfering voice, Ahmed Ayoub. Uh, the HDL is formed in the small intestine and the liver. Uh, it, it undergo lipidation in these organs till it become premature. I want to remind you that there is always in our body a cross talk between the HDL on one side and the triglyceride rich lipoprotein in other sides, which are namely the chylomicron from the, from the GIT and the very low density lipoprotein from the liver. And actually, this cross talk is through many enzymes and the uh, uh, transporter lead to exchange of some lipid particle uh, between this lipoprotein. For example, triglycerides, when it is high in the chylomicron, it uh, transport to the HDL in exchange for cholesterol ester. The end result is the formation of remnants uh, for chylomicron and the Regarding the very low density lipoprotein, also this cross take ending in what is called remnant. I'm sorry, Ahmed, from ICOM, but I, I hear some interfering voice from the employee of ICOM. Please uh, check that. I wanted to uh, stress here on this remnant particles. These remnant particles actually remain in the blood for a few hours after meals. That's why the, uh, it is important sometimes to check for the non-fasting triglycerides, non-fasting lipid profile. To, this is the way to assess the importance of this or the value uh, of these remnant uh, particles that is present a few hours after uh, uh, the meal. This triglyceride-rich remnant liporoutine is actually very atherogenic particles. Uh, it is maybe as atherogenic as uh, LDL, maybe more, as I will explain why. And this acerogenic lipo-rich, uh, uh, um, uh, triglyceride-rich remnant lipoprotein is filled with what we call the remnant cholesterol and some triglycerides, and they are the uh, uh, product of metabolism of the chylomicron of the very low density lipoprotein and the intermediate density lipoprotein. Usually in the non-fasting, uh, uh, triglyceride level is a good marker of high triglyceride-rich lipoprotein rather than the fasting sample. If you look at the acerogenicity of these remnants particles, uh, we know that LDL particles, when it is small, when it is non-oxidized, it can enter the endothelium, subantimal, uh, start the atherosclerotic and inflammatory process with the macrophage and others. The remnants lipoprotein do the same. As, uh, like LDL cholesterol, it can penetrate uh, uh, subantimal, uh, uh, interact with the macrophage, and start the process of atherosclerosis. Not only that, but in addition, the lipolysis lead to a high content of free fatty acids and monoacylglycerol that is add to atherogenity of this particle, more inflammation, even more than what LDL cholesterol can do. Uh, so the, the, why triglyceride is important, why high triglyceride, especially in the non-fasting uh, situation, is important? Because actually it can affect the uh, um, LDL particle size. If you have two guys with the same LDL cholesterol level, 100 milligram for, for each, and this guy has a high uh, non-fasting triglycerides or high triglyceride, his particle size is smaller and denser. And that's why many believe that evaluation of LDLP, which is LDL particle number or size, is much, much better in risk assessment than evaluation of the LDLC. Because LDLC means that the cholesterol carried by LDL particles. And here, LDLC here is the same like LDLC there. But LDLP is different, and this is, can uh, uh, mark the acerogenicity of the part. So what is remnant cholesterol and how can we calculate it? 
Remnant cholesterol is the cholesterol carried by this triglyceride-rich lipoprotein, chylomicron remnant, very low density lipoprotein, and intermediate density lipoprotein. And this is, as I as I told you, this is can be detected if we do non-fasting triglyceride and find it high. So how to calculate the remnant cholesterol? cholesterol? Simply, remnant cholesterol is the total cholesterol minus LDL cholesterol minus HDL cholesterol, and it represents the acerogenic cholesterol in all the acerogenic particles, not only the LDL cholesterol, which is the cholesterol carried by the low-density lipoprotein only, not the others. Of course, this is a picture, uh, Andrea, of the uh, uh, last year uh, cardio risk uh, in Hergada, Red Sea, Egypt, uh, uh, when we were, uh, when we was non-virtual, and I hope we uh, again and again we can uh, uh, meet again. Uh, so triglyceride actually is very important, and if we look at the uh, percentage of triglyceride in the general population, uh, I, I think uh, uh, we can refer to the Copenhagen general population study. Uh, a lot, uh, many uh, population, uh, uh, 84,000 uh, populations. Uh, what is the percentage of uh, high triglyceride? Uh, mild to moderate elevated triglyceride was present in 27%. Of course, the, all these population are at risk of having uh, uh, high triglyceride-rich lipoprotein, at risk of having small particle size of LDL cholesterol, even if the LDL cholesterol is not uh, elevated. Of course, in the general population, some may have monogenic defects with severe hypertriglyceridemia, thousands of milligrams per deciliter, but this is very rare, 0.1% of population. This is what I am concerned uh, more uh, in general population because this is a population uh, uh, problem actually on uh, when on epidemiological uh, basis. So let us now see how lipoprotein cholesterol is a function of the increased level of non-fasting triglyceride. The question is what can non-fasting triglyceride do with HDL, with LDL, and with this acerogenic remnant cholesterol? If the, this is a non-fasting triglyceride level, as you go to the right, you, uh, there is increase in the triglyceride. So let us see first the effect on HDL. The higher the triglyceride, or the non-fasting triglyceride, the lower is your HDL. What about LDL? The higher the triglyceride level, there is no effect on the LDL cholesterol level. But as I told you, the effect is on the particle size rather than the LDL cholesterol level itself. And how we know that? By looking at the effect on the remnant cholesterol, that is cholesterol in LDL and the other acerogenic particle, and the higher the triglyceride level, as you see, the higher is the remnant cholesterol. So it's really very important uh, uh, to know that the non-fasting triglyceride have very important effect on the acerogenicity of the lipoprotein in our body, and it is very important increasing the remnant cholesterol, decreasing the HDL, and altering the particle size of the LDL lipoprotein. So actually, we was uh, in the past few year, tens of years in what we called, or what I called, the triglyceride dilemma. Why triglyceride was a dilemma? Triglyceride was a dilemma because we know that those with high triglycerides have the higher risk. But however, when we treat, we are treating LDL cholesterol. Why you are not treating triglycerides? Because triglycerides affect the whole lipid uh, metabolism in our body, and by the end of the way, it renders the LDL cholesterol more atherogenic and smaller and easily oxidized. However, this triglyceride dilemma may be in, uh, solved uh, partially in the last few years, and we now have guidelines uh, regarding the triglycerides uh, uh, if we look at the high risk patient, high cardiovascular risk patient, according to triglyceride uh, to risk score, and triglyceride is above 200 milligram, the priority, as I told you, is to start statin therapy. This is class one indication to reduce the LDL cholesterol to reach the goals of the, the, the LDL cholesterol. However, recently after the reduced trial, uh, especially in patients with secondary prevention, if after 
reaching the goal with the statin, LDL goal with the statin, you find your triglyceride above 135, you can start icosapente acyl, and this is class 2A indication. 2A means should be should be considered. Phenofibrates still in the uh, have a role, especially for primary prevention cases, high risk patients. If LDL cholesterol at goal, but the triglyceride is above 200 milligram per deciliter, and actually phenofibrate has a lot of theoretical uh, mechanisms of action that render this drug uh, uh, important when it is indicated. And if we look at the phenofibrate mechanism of action. Uh, uh, through activation of the PEPAR, it have about four actions that can be affecting the process of atherosclerosis in our body. Of course, first, the effect on the lipid and lipoprotein, uh, uh, triglyceride-triglyceride-rich lipoprotein, plasma clearance of this uh, triglyceride-rich particles uh, uh, the, the affect the oxidation of the fatty acids, it affects the triglyceride Senses, it can lead to some increase in the HDL cholesterol and maybe some reduction of the lipoprotein little a. It also has direct effect of the EPO proteins, effect on the cholesterol transporter, and more importantly is an even phenofibrate has what we call the pleiotropic effect. It can affect the C-reactive protein, have some anti-inflammatory effect, and also uh, by through uh, reducing the plasma fibrinogen, it may have some anti-thrombotic effect. So actually, at least from the theoretical point of view, uh, 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 this is a very important drug, despite in the guidelines, it's still class 2B indications, especially if the patient not reaching the goal and his triglyceride is still above 200 and milligram per deciliter. Uh, the importance of the triglyceride-rich lipoprotein uh, 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 is highlighted in the guidelines when the guidelines concentrated on the uh, other parameters rather than LDL. So after reaching the LDL goal, you have to look at the non-HDL cholesterol. You have goals for the non-HDL cholesterol, which is less than 85, less than 100, and less than 130 according to the risk, uh, very high risk, high risk or moderate risk. Another important secondary goal is the apolipoprotein B. And the apolipoprotein is very important. Because if you have high APOB in your body, in your blood, that means that your LDL particle size is small. And APOB also, like non-HDL cholesterol, is a secondary goal. And we have numbers less than 65, less than 80, and less than 100. Unfortunately, we have no goals for the triglyceride, but it's better to be less than 150 milligram per DC liter. And it's better to uh, uh, know that Higher level of triglyceride indicate the need of metabolic risk assessment and maybe hemoglobin A1C should be strictly uh, 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 controlled in patients with hypertriglyceridemia. Uh, this uh, uh, diagram illustrates the importance of uh, controlling something like non-HDL cholesterol in addition to controlling LDL cholesterol. And this answer important questions. What happens if you control the LDL cholesterol only, reaching the goals, but your non-HDL cholesterol is still above the goals, compared to a, another group of patients when we reach the goal of the LDL and reaching the goal of non-HDL cholesterol, and here the hazard ratio is really more in those uh, who are uh, uh, not at goal for the non-HDL cholesterol. So it is very important for our patients uh, to reach the LDL goal but more important is after reaching the LDL goal, just look at the non-HDL cholesterol and try to reduce it in order to decrease the risk of your patient. So for a comprehensive, uh, let me finish my presentation by uh, comprehensive lipid management uh, need not only concentrating on the LDL cholesterol, but we have keep on eye after reaching the LDL goal on a parameter like non-HDL cholesterol, the remnant cholesterol and triglycerides, and this is highlight the importance of the triglyceride-rich lipoprotein in the acidogenicity of our body. And I will leave the mic to my colleague, Professor Atif, for a short discussion. Dr. Atif, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ashraf, for your uh, lecture. And now we have uh, a question from uh, Dr. Ihab. Dr. Ihab. 
Unmute, yeah, help. Unmute. You are mute, yeah. Okay, okay. First, I would like to say hello to everyone. It's a pleasure seeing you online as, uh, uh, as always. Actually, I was interested in asking, uh, what do you think of the emerging therapies uh, for hypertriglyceridemia? They are kind of like disappointing, most of them, except for the uh, only one that we had some good results, the, uh, the VASEPA, which is the pure omega-3 that showed results in reduce it, but the strength was disappointing. And uh, even, uh, I mean, it's been stopped. Uh, we're waiting for the prominent, for the uh, Pima fibrate. They just ba barely uh, um, yeah, already recruited the 10,000 patients they were waiting for. And there is also the failure of the, which I personally was anticipating that it would work. I wanted to hear your comment on the uh, anti-C3 oligonucleotide antisense, which again, uh, the approach trial, which uh, was stopped in uh, by, uh, by the FDA because of thrombocytopenia, not promising. So we're left with what? The, the, the other drugs, the, I mean, what drugs? The angiopoietin-like protein-3, which is still, uh, it's, there's a uh, monoclonal antibody as well as uh, an oligo sense. Uh, we don't know, are they going to work or not? And the oral drugs have failed, the other oral drugs, because of GI disturbances and have been stopped as well. So everything that's been tried for triglycerides is not materializing. So what hope do we have besides giving the VASEPA to our patients? Well, Arthur, I have, uh, thank you for the questions. Actually, uh, uh, that's why I, I, I call it triglyceride dilemma. Uh, however, I want to concentrate on the uh, uh, patients with high cardiovascular risk, with average hypertriglyceridemia, and uh, I try to ask you questions why uh, in the previous clinical trials we find that when we give something to reduce the triglyceride in such group of patients, there is no uh, event reduction as we expect, uh, except for the reduced trial uh, lately. Uh, I have an explanation for that, maybe because in, uh, in the previous trial, like phenofibrates trial, for example, uh, maybe the patient was not uh, uh, at a higher, uh, enough higher risk to uh, anticipate uh, uh, good risk reduction in short period of time. Uh, maybe they need to design a study as with, uh, trying to th these drugs in very high risk populations. And that's why maybe the reduced trial when you started to include more patients with secondary prevention and more patients with high risk, you started to find uh, 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 good clinical results. So um, we know that hypertriglyceridemia, especially the moderate type, I'm not talking about the genetic type with thousands of triglycerides. This is specific uh, uh, type of hypertriglyceridemia, 0.1% of general population. Of course, it needs attention, but it's very difficult till now to treat, the, we have some option, uh, uh, little bit options to treat. Uh, I want to concentrate on the other side, which uh, a guy like me and you maybe I may have some uh, mod, mild or moderate hypertriglyceridemia, uh, some other risk factor or not. Uh, we, 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 I have to know, to uh, stress the point that this mild hypertriglyceridemia is acerogenic, uh, and it should deserve. Uh, uh, um, Try to control at least by lifestyle intervention, at least by improving the metabolic uh, profile uh, of the body. And when it is indicated, we don't have uh, the tools we have now is the omega-3 or the phenofibrates uh, uh, waiting for uh, uh, more trials in a higher risk population. Uh, just a final question also uh, to show how disappointed we are in treating hypertriglyceridemia. I mean, the main reason for treating it was to prevent pancreatitis. And it's also failed to do anything for pancreatitis. It doesn't, if you control triglycerides with these drugs, you still can get pancreatitis. I mean, uh, these drugs are not doing anything. <laughs> this is in the subset thing. of patients with genetic hypertriglyceridemia and thousands uh, yeah, it hasn't been shown to reduce uh, pancreatitis, whatever was used. And I doubt that the uh, VASEPA will, will do any of that stuff. 
It's good only for probably reducing cardiovascular events, but not pancreatitis. Anyway, these were just my um, okay. comments for hypertriglyceridemia. Thank you, <laughs> Andrea. Yeah, just a very quick question. So, of course, uh, I agree fully with Dr. Ihab. Actually, we are all eagerly awaiting prominence. So this is like because I think the study design looks much better. Uh, but in the meantime, Ashraf, just a very practical question. Since we are all like guided to those statins as the first step, um, who would you actually in the current setting ever resort to to give a phenofibrate? And uh, uh, how how do you, do you practically then limit your doses of statins, or are you happy with high dose statin therapy in in accordance with uh, phenofibrate? I mean, we all have this terrible experience in the old days with gemfibrosil, of course, which was much more sure. um, with more complications. So, what's your thought on this, very practically speaking? <laughs> First of all, the indication uh, is uh, in the guideline. We have the guidelines, and then the guidelines is telling us that it is class 2B indications, especially if patients with primary prevention, high risk patients, after reaching the LDL goal. From the practical point of view, if, if I have to give these two drugs, I try to give one in the morning and one in the evening. At least to, this is reduced uh, uh, the, the side effects uh, even more than if you reduce the dose of statin. Um, and usually, I, I don't reduce the dose of statin because I, maximum intensity or high maximum tolerated statin is a primary uh, therapeutic modality to reduce the cardiovascular risk. So we give the phenofibrates. Uh, usually, if you give it one in the morning, one in the evening, it's very rare to have side effects. But you have to keep an eye, of course, on the renal function, on the uh, liver enzymes, any symptoms of the patient. Other, otherwise, Derek, do you have a comment, Derek? Um, you'll hear my comments probably in my talk. <laughs> so, uh, it's, yeah, in yeah. Your, uh, <laughs> it's in your courtyard, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Out of, I think, because of time, you can uh, proceed okay. with the... Uh... So, we uh, now next, uh, we come to the last uh, lecture, or before the last lecture, the last lecture by uh, dear Professor Derek von Defineski, BCK9 inhibitors and the guidelines. Please do it. In the end, I'll ask you on the Odyssey trial. Very simple. Yes. In the presentation, in the end, on the Odyssey trial. I know. I know. Okay. Okay. We're waiting, Dr. Derek. Do you already see my slides? And am yes. I supposed to start yeah. immediately? Yes. Yes. Excellent. So thank you very much again for having the opportunity, the honorable opportunity to present a few thoughts on PCSK9 in the guidelines and. As was nicely pointed out, there are many targets besides LDL, but still there's only one lipoprotein that really won the Nobel Prize in 1985, and that was for the characterization of the LDL receptor, which is by far, I think, the most important target and the main culprit talking about uh, lipid-associated atherosclerosis. And I only want to briefly introduce you to, to a concept in three slides and that was already um, proposed more than 10 years ago. We do see that most patients, almost half of them at an age of maybe 70 to 75, develop some kind of cardio, uh, coronary heart disease. And although maybe female sex may be preventive, are there any other risk factors that rather decrease the threshold and people will get coronary heart disease earlier. And it was seen for decades, of course, that if there are genetic variations, heterogeneous or even homogeneous, these patients or people will get disease at earlier age or even during adolescence. And already 10 years ago, it was shown that a mutation in the PCSK9 prevents the development of uh, coronary heart disease and therefore somehow paving the track towards a therapeutical use. And as Professor Zillig already pointed out, there is still a difference and an effect of even greater magnitude if you take genetic studies with the same decrease in LDL of these patients compared to statin trials, sorry, I'll get back to this. So the effect, which is maybe 
for one micromole per liter LDL reduction set in trials around 20 to 25 percent. The same decrease in LDL will result in more than twice the effect if you have a lifelong reduction. So it's like the pack years we count for smoking. You would probably have to count the LDL exposure years to get a better idea on the risk the patient has. And therefore, you know this graph very well. And the more studies come, um, the more crowded it gets, but it doesn't change its message. It's a reduction of the LDL with a drug reduces your risk by maybe 20 to 25 percent. These are the genetic studies, and it looks very much the same, but the scale is a little different. And if you transpose this graph into this one, you do see that the correlation is much steeper with the genetic methods to reduce LDL. And this might be a chance in the future to probably, like already introduced, a vaccination, for example, could help to treat elevated LDL very, very early in the life. So my task was to report a little bit on the guidelines, and I want to only briefly share the first guideline I'm aware of that implemented very low levels, less than 55 milligram per deciliter, and that was already in 2017 by the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists and American College of Endocrinology. They'd been first, and by the meantime, we experienced this last year at the ESC meeting in Paris, there are three major European guidelines now adapting to this very low levels. And these are the ones I want to briefly give you. And to introduce that, I just want to show you like a nice vessel of a child will develop if you keep it fairly healthy towards some atherosclerosis at older age. But if you have by chance, being unlucky, or with a very poor lifestyle, you develop atherosclerosis much faster and will probably or definitely get severe problems at this age with vessels looking like that. So the first ESC guideline presented um, last year is the one on the chronic coronary syndrome. And as you can appreciate um, over here, we have class one recommendations also to use the PCSK9 inhibitor. And this phrase will come back quite a few times during the guidelines. The lipid lowering drugs for patients at very high risk who do not achieve their goals on maximum tolerated dose of statin and desactamide combination with the PCSK9 inhibitor is recommended. And very much so is the second quote on PCSK9 in these guidelines and lipid lowering drugs in more detail. Secondly, um, we have a guideline on diabetes as well. And of course, as we have already heard, these patients with diabetes are at very high risk um, for cardiovascular morbidity. And in these guidelines, the treatment, again, is very much the same. But, and I don't want to repeat it again, they state at the same page that there are still gaps in evidence especially on the role of PCSK9 inhibitors in patients with diabetes. And this remains to be further elucidated and needs more trials. And we just got, end of last year, a post hoc analysis, a pre-specified post hoc analysis of the Odyssey outcome trial. And what you can appreciate is, of course, patients with diabetes, these are the red bars compared to the blue bars of pre-diabetes, a normal glycemia with the green bars. The risk in patients having diabetes is, of course, much higher. The incidence of events was much higher. And this counts both for these major adverse cardio, cardiovascular events as well as death, non-fatal myocardial infarction, ischemic stroke, and less so for unstable angina. But I think what is important to mention at this stage is that the PCSK9 inhibition works all the same, totally independent of the presence of diabetes or not. So um, I think we can be pretty sure 
that uh, this treatment works well in diabetic patients as well. And if you take in this study, um, this next slide and look on the relative risk reduction, this is, as I've already pointed out, more or less the same. Whereas, of course, if you have the relative risk, more or less the same, um, you have an absolute risk reduction, which is predominantly seen in these patients at highest risk. And this, again, are the diabetic ones. So maybe, and we have to look for the patients that have the highest risk, as Professor Zivik already pointed out, because these are the ones who benefit most, especially in very costly um, therapies. Two more smaller studies I'd like to share with you before getting to the last and probably most prominent guideline released last year by the ESC is here the EGO-PAX trial with only 308 patients. But the trial design was um, tough because these patients with acute coronary syndrome were meant to receive the first dose of evolucumab within 24 hours after um, reaching the hospital for acute coronary syndrome. And then it was slightly elaborate on how LDL had to be, but more or less um, in all groups, the setting was you got the acute coronary syndrome, you got your first dose within 24 hours, you got two other doses, and then your lipid profile was taken. And as you can appreciate, the achievement of the LDL target was much better, of course, if you had the PCSK9 inhibitor on board in addition to your lipid lowering therapy using um, statins. And this can also be seen in this small graph. So already after four weeks and the first doses you got, your LDL dropped down considerably and maintained and stayed there all over the trial duration. And as we do see in almost all the PCSK9 trials, there are hardly any additional adverse events with these drugs. So um, they must be considered to be very safe and therefore probably help us in the future even more um, to treat our patients. A second pre-specified subgroup of the Odyssey outcome I would like to share with you, it was also released only a few months ago, is the one where patients with prior cabbage had been put in a special group with the idea that these patients already having received cabbage have most likely even more diseased vessels than the other ones. And you can see as expected that the maize rate is much higher in this green group of patients already having had cabbage compared to those never had cabbage or a small group of patients who got cabbage for the index event. And again, the biggest effect is seen in the patients with the largest risk, and these are the ones up here in green. Lastly, uh, the ones who had been lucky to visit, visit the ESC in Paris and had been brave enough not to visit the ESC meeting every day, but visiting the Louvre might have seen Mona Lisa. And if you could a careful look, you probably did see that she was diseased at her time as well with both clantelasmins and xantoma. And therefore, um, this resembles what we do see in our patients mainly in daily routine. So how can we treat that? How can we treat real dyslipidemia? And this was the topic third um, ESC guideline presented in Paris. And then we do have now a statement on lipid lowering therapy in patients with ACS. And this is based on the data I already shared. And again, we are supposed to add PCSK9 inhibitor if the target is not achieved with statins and acetamide. And if possible, during hospitalization for the ACS event, so very early on in the um, disease um, of the patient. And if you want to only briefly highlight the changes from the previous guideline from 2015 to 2019, you do see that the class B 
um, indication shifted to a class one indication to use for secondary prevention PCSK9 inhibitors if you do not achieve your goals. For the family of hypercholesterolemia patients, it's also shifted upwards to 1A indication. And the same is true that the PCSK9 antibodies should be considered in these patients much earlier with the newer guidelines. And the last class one recommendation we do have is, and this is, I think, very important for the rehabilitation centers, that in patients which do not achieve after the ACS within four to six weeks, and at least in Austria, this is approximately the time where the patient is in the rehabilitation center, and will definitely get another lipid status. And in these, probably many patients, you do see that the LDL goal is not achieved yet, the PCSK9 inhibitor should be initiated. There is one further, I do think, very interesting um, trial and already providing long-term data, and this is the very early Osler 1 trial with 2,255 patients who received ivalocumab um, versus placebo. And at the end of the initial trial, these patients uh, or the drug was made available to all patients. And as you can see, over time pools of five years, the LDL maintained at the same very low levels as the variant group had in the trial. And the adverse events, this is, I think, of um, high interest. The adverse events, I only took a few of those from the paper, rather decrease and decline especially the ones with uh, potential injection site reactions hardly exist after five years. So there are probably a subset of patients that might have problems with the injection site. But once you get like used to it or you have been proven not to have reactions, probably after five years, you won't have any problems from that. And the same is true, and that's probably a matter of adverse events, that the discontinuation rate drops to very, very low numbers, well below a percent per year. Last thing that is mentioned in the ESC dyslipidemia, dyslipidemia guidelines is the cost effectiveness. And I want to share two thoughts and one slide with you that, of course, in drugs, that are costly, like the PCSK9 inhibitors are, that plays a role. And I think one of the best um, papers done on these ideas is already two years old now, but they calculated for a yearly price of 6,000 and 3,000 euro, how much a quality, a quality adjusted life year um, might cost. And then you get these graphs and you can um, assume that probably this is the effect in the green box. And in patients, I hope it's well visible for you, but these blue ones are the ones with highest risk because of familiar hypercholesterolemia, whereas the green line with very high costs for equality are the ones that only have vascular disease and diabetes. And in the middle, there are the ones with a 10-year MACE risk of 20 or 30%. So if you do look at these numbers, and at least in Germany and Austria, you have prices like that that resemble nicely to the one and the second graph you see up there. You end up with costs for quality adjusted life years of approximately 70 to 80,000 for high risk patients. And this is internationally still acceptable. But if you treat everybody you might want to treat, you probably end up with costs to up to 300,000 um, euro for every quality you gain. And therefore, I think our major task as a scientific community is to really identify and look for those patients who are at highest risk using the classic risk factors, but hopefully adding a few more and probably more precise risk factors to these algorithms um, to decide whom to help best. And in Graz, we therefore implemented a high-risk patients, outpatients clinic that is um, in, um, as a team 
um, a team outpatient clinic together with our endocrinologists because it's not only hyperlipidemia, but in very many cases it's also diabetes that triggers these extremely high risk in our cardiovascular patients. And therefore I think it's very rational but very good idea at the same time to work together with the endocrinologists to really give our patients the best treatment they can get. Lastly, I want to share this slide, which I think illustrates why these antibody therapies are so costly, because to produce antibodies is a very tough procedure, and it will never be as cheap as other drugs we have in our racks. And although production of antibodies became more and more um, industrialized the works in cells already, and um, it's still costly. And therefore, one might think if other drugs like silencing RNA, which is probably easier to produce, might be a future competitor um, for the PCSK9 inhibitors. And as you are probably aware of, I think it was Novartis buying the rights for increase Iran with the Orion 1 trial, uh, trial is uh, done with for 12 billion euro just a few months ago. And what was seen using the silencing RNA that you also, like with the PCSK9 inhibitors, ended up with very large reduction in your LDL levels. And now recently published in the New England Journal, the Orion 10 and 11 data with 3,178 patients with cardiovascular disease was shown. And again, you have a maintained decrease um, of your LDL levels in these groups. And again, like with the PCSK9 inhibitors, you have any, hardly any increased adverse events. You have benefits with the other cardiovascular adverse events and very few injection site related ones. Lastly, and we already heard for it, so I'll keep it brief. With the reduced it trial, we did see with the Icos of Panther 2 as well a significant effect on the very hard primary endpoint they used, and also with the key secondary endpoint, resembled the primary endpoint almost to 100%. Lastly, there might be one new kit on the block with clear wisdom trial and the whole CLEAR project, including more patients than the 70s, 779 in the CLEAR wisdom, did show that with pampidoic acid, which is a little bit more proximal to the um, statin uh, um, uh, derived therapies, you can also decrease LDL on top of already well in place anti lipid therapy. And in a few, de a few days ago, um, they got European approval for a pure bamponic acid um, therapy as well as combination together with isatomide. And again, and I think we are very lucky compared to others that in the treatment of dyslipidemia, we have very, very few adverse events. So let me please sum up that the LDL is, I think, still the most important target in lipid-lowering therapies. And there's a lifetime risk. I think we have to be even more aware of um, for elevated LDL levels, indicating that we have to treat probably earlier than we did all new EC guidelines aim for lower LDL targets and recommend PCSK9 inhibitors if oral therapy is not sufficient. And PCSK9 inhibitors work independent of the presence of diabetes mellitus, so we can very, very well use them in these patients' group as well. The OSLA1 indicates a completely maintained efficacy over years, and the initiation of PCSK9 is recommended and safe early or probably immediately after acute coronary syndrome. And if PCSK9 inhibitors might not be sufficient, we will have further drugs like inclisiran, icosapan, and bempedoic acid. So I hope uh, we will have enough weapons to fight dyslipidemia. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Derek, for your magnificent lecture. And I think identification of our patients is very important to cross the barrier, to use the basic nine, if you agree with me. 
For sure. So I think we have been very happy to have statins. Yeah. If you think back uh, 30 years ago, and we probably didn't have anything really. And we thought statins are so powerful, we will never need anything more. And we learned over years introducing our LDL targets step by step. And I think we are still not at the, at the finish line. We'll see even further reductions of the LDL targets. And we won't okay. be able to reach these targets with statins alone. We won't reach it with statins in combination with acetamide. So we need more weapons, as I call them, a little bit too brutal. Mm -hmm. And PCSK9 is the ones we already have in our hands. And they're very good. And they're very few adverse events. Okay. So we have uh, some short questions from uh, Professor Hani Raghi, from Professor Ahmad Shawi, Professor Mohammed Salim, and uh, Dr. Ihab. If you want, uh, Andrea, if you want to discuss anything. So we, we start with Hani Raghi. Um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Von Lewinsky, uh, Dirk. That was a brilliant presentation. Um, I'm actually waiting for the big British trial on Glyziran uh, to see if it's uh, uh, going to work or not. I think the NHS is trying it. And indeed, uh, Dr. Braunwald said uh, that at some point we're going to screen everybody before the age of 30 and give them twice yearly uh, yeah. uh, messenger RNA, PCSK9, and possibly get rid of atherosclerosis altogether. My question to you is about a type of patients uh, that I have actually uh, been seeing, which is people who have had strong family history of coronary artery disease, but have really, from a young age, uh, followed a very healthy lifestyle, um, non-smokers, um, people who run 10 kilometers a day. Um, and, you know, people come with an LDL of 200, 200 plus, and I see some of them. And uh, I have a few, and I actually, uh, I immediately start prescribing, and some refuse drugs and say, no, 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 my lifestyle. So what I do is I actually screen them for, uh, for subclinical atherosclerosis. I do calcium scoring, IMTs. I'm talking about completely asymptomatic people. And I have dared to leave people with LDL of above 200 um, without any symptoms, and, but with a family history of premature coronary artery disease, uh, when, there, when I have no clinical evidence, when I have no subclinical evidence of atherosclerosis, when I have zero calcium scoring and completely clean carotids, how do you feel about not treating such patients? I do feel worse and worse because I think it's only a matter of time, of course. I think in a 30-year-old patient or person, you won't find very much. Probably you won't find anything because 30 years are not enough. But if you consider that the patient will probably become 80, 90, or maybe young people now thought to become even 100 years old, all of them will develop at a certain time atherosclerosis. So I think it is, of course, difficult to understand for the patients if they say, well, but I have like the perfect lifestyle. So it would be unfair if anything happens to me. They are right. It is unfair because your genes are unfair. And if you have the wrong genes, you can do whatever you want. There are other patients who have like genes that make them very prone to get a cancer. And they can say, it's unfair. Why do I have this cancer to get uh, a carcinoma? And my risk is much higher than in others. But this is the same in patients having uh, family um, anamnesis and therefore probably the wrong genes to get atherosclerosis due to their dyslipidemia. And therefore, we have this data from Jupiter with primary prevention, but that was, of course, uh, still a group with some kind of risk factors and the elevated inflammation. But I think we will end up saying that every patient who has these elevated levels, and you can already take them right after birth because much of your LDL burden is um, already seen in your very early days. Um, and then, of course, you can still decide because you don't know or not yet aware enough of um, adverse events to treat small children. But I think once you're a, um, adult, 
you should probably start treating. Yes. Yeah, but I, I was specific to uh, pointing out that this is a patient who has not, um, th there are patients who have not developed at all any evidence of subclinical atherosclerosis. And since we don't really treat numbers, I mean, treating numbers is dangerous. There might be, I mean, the issue is, does this extremely healthy lifestyle, in a way, sorry for using that word, trump their genes? <laughs> um, it's possible. It's possible. Trump is good. No? So my, my point is, I will treat any patient uh, with an elevation above 190 as per the guidelines. I mean, this is one of the four classes of benefits in the previous guideline. But I'm talking specifically about looking at the disease and not at the number. So looking at subclinical atherosclerosis with the tools that we have now, uh, you can actually see. I mean, obviously... If I, uh, I mean, 30 years, uh, and what you said that is actually quite enough for the carotid to get a little bit of, of atherosclerosis, which is enough for me to scare the patient. But I'm talking about patients who have not developed any form of disease for 40 years. Nothing, zero, zero yeah. calcium, normal IMT, absolutely no atherosclerosis. And yeah. You're asking me to treat a number, which I agree with, but I think maybe one day this will change. Yeah, so uh, I think we're very close together, and I completely agree that at this time, thinking about evidence-based medicine, you will probably not treat these patients. But on the other hand, I'm very sure that none of these patients having an LDL of more than 200 will become 70 years old and still not having any problems. So I think it's a good way with very few adverse uh, events to treat these patients early. I think we will get the evidence within the next years, but as these trials are of course very difficult to conduct, you won't get real clinical trials with follow-ups of like 30 or 40 years, because if you start them now, we'll have the evidence if you're all retired, so you have like uh, extrapolate from other data. What Thank you, Hani. Ahmed. Yeah. Okay, um, just a quick question. Um, thank you, uh, Dirk. Thank you, Andrea. It's always lovely to see you guys. Um, this is the first time the European guidelines really talked about cost effectivity in any part. And um, do you think that part of, um, you know, um, the class of recommendation for PCSK9 in those with previous atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or ACS, I know it's related to Odyssey and Fourier too, has extremely high uh, indication, class recommendation one, while in primary prevention, if you do not reach your goals with statins or ezetimibe, then adding a PCSK9 is quite a lower class of recommendation. So do you think part of it is also cost um, benefit or is it just because of the evidence? I think it's both. We don't have the evidence in these very low-risk patients because these trials do not exist. On the other hand, um, we won't be able to afford, no health system in the world will be able to afford to treat everybody you might want to treat with these. So for one side is we have to identify the ones who benefit most. And the second is I think prices will decline because more kids are on the block. And that will help us to treat our patients because if the drug gets cheaper, yes, I think um, authorities will give green light much faster. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Ahmed. And now from the Caribbean, see, uh, Dr. Salim. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Atif. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dirk, Dr. Andrea. I enjoyed really your presentation, wonderful presentation. Uh, I have a small question about uh, the use of PCSK9 inhibitor uh, in very specific high-risk group, which is patients with uh, moderate to severe chronic kidney disease. And the safety of, of use of PCSK9 inhibitors also uh, in patients on regular hemodialysis. Uh, what do you think about the use of PCSK9 inhibitors in uh, this uh, subgroup of high-risk patients? Okay. Again, being evidence-based, we have very little evidence, but I think on the other side, the mechanism of PCSK9 does not 
interfere or is not interfered by kidney disease, to my best knowledge. And therefore, I think it will work the same. There might be small differences if you really test it in a trial, but I think even with very reduced kidney function or even being on dialysis, these patients will benefit from this therapy very much the same like uh, compared to others. Okay. I think we finished the questions for the sake of time. I thank you very much, Derek. You need one question, uh, okay. Actually, yes, so, because just yes, very, Andrea. Very, very, very brief. Uh, so uh, I love the question of uh, Professor. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm sorry. I, no worries. I love the question of Professor Raggi. So Derek, let me challenge you more. Let's okay. see. This, let's increase this age up to 80 and the guy has never had a disease and comes in with 220 LDL. So yeah. any concerns in not treating that at this point? And my second part, uh, uh, not everyone can, of course, always have a system as we are now establishing it with a high-risk outpatient service. And we know uh, treatment adjustment after an event may be dismal. So shouldn't we, we know very well how much by average, by percentage, these drugs work. So shouldn't there be like a cutoff where we say, yeah, guys that come in with more than 220 are preemptively already treated with a PCSK9 uh, in the very high risk group with a PCSK9 uh, uh, containing regimen, uh, because we know it will not go, it will not work otherwise. Hmm? Yeah. So two questions. The one is with the elderly patients. And I think we have nice data from France, I think from last year, where they did show it makes problems if you stop statin treatment in the very elderly ones. So to answer your question, if there was a patient with AT on PCSK9, I would remain the PCSK9 therapy. But to be honest, if a patient's 80 years old comes to the clinic and I want to prevent <laughs> events within the next 10 years, I would be very restrictive also for cost uh, reasons and this is um, for your second part of the question as well i think it is a bit of wishful thinking i would like to treat everybody with an ldl over 200 with pcsk9 inhibitor early but i know that i and probably the gp outside will get problems with the authorities and then you have to weigh these two problems yes we got it derek yes you are right now uh, it's uh, a lecture for the uh, sponsorship uh, company, uh, Sanofi, by uh, Ashraf Reda, uh, for the lessons from the real world after the Odessi trials. Odessi Apprise, lessons from the real world. Thank you, Atif, and thank you, Dirk. Dirk, I enjoyed your presentation so much, and I enjoyed the questions of uh, Andrea about 80 years guy with. Uh, Nothing but high LDL, <laughs> very <laughs> difficult situation. But according to the guidelines, uh, if secondary prevention should be treated as secondary prevention, if primary prevention, no treatment, except after discussion with the guy about the side effects, you may start with a small dose uh, 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 and uh, increase it gradually. Anyway, we, in, the, in the next few minutes, I will uh, try to uh, uh, um, share with you uh, some... Okay, uh, Hani, please unmute. Uh, I will try to share with you some recent data from the last virtual SEC uh, meeting that was in uh, in March. It was actually real uh, 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 nice uh, uh, meetings and uh, a lot of attendee from all over the world. Uh, uh, the first AC, virtual SEC meeting was excellent, actually. Uh, let us uh, review uh, some uh, of this uh, data presented at that meeting uh, about the this trail. Um, I think this is the first paper uh, uh, about the efficacy and safety of alorecumab in a real-life setting in patients with or without familial hepatocholesterolemia, uh, which was called the Odyssey Apprise or, or Apprise uh, study. And actually, this study tried to answer two questions. Uh, uh, those uh, uh, to see what happened in the real world in these patients. Uh, those, of course, uh, inclusion criteria, patients with inadequate control of the cardiovascular risk, whether they have heterozygous or non-familial hypercholesterolemia, but at high cardiovascular risk. Uh, they try to see the safety and efficacy data of alirucumab 
uh, as a PSK9 inhibitor in these uh, patients. Uh, of course, uh, all of them has uh, or have hypercholesterolemia despite uh, 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 maximal tolerated statin and maybe other lipid lowering therapy. So it was an open, uh, an open label study, uh, a treatment period between 12 weeks and 30 uh, months. Uh, using alirikumab, 70, usual dose you know, 75 milligram or 150 milligram every uh, two weeks. Uh, the primary endpoint was to assess the safety parameter. Secondary uh, 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 um, uh, endpoints was to see uh, uh, if the proportion of patients achieving a predetermined LDL goal, uh, 70 at that time, uh, or 50% reduction, um, also, they study the safety and the efficacy parameter, descriptive statistics for overall population. Uh, if you look at the uh, uh, overall side effects or uh, uh, treatment emergent adverse events in uh, the whole population using lip, uh, lipid lowering therapies and PSK9 inhibitors, uh, this is the overall of any uh, side effects. This is a treatment emergent ser serious side effects. And this is a side effect that may lead to mortality, and this is leading to permanent treatment discontinuation. And all of our, as you see, the incidence of uh, or percentage of serious side, side effect is uh, uh, low, especially those leading to mortality uh, from 0%, 0.3%, 0.2%, 0 0.2%, whether they are familial hypercholesterolemia or not, or patient without familial hypercholesterolemia. Uh, also, the methodology. Sorry. Uh, if we if we look at the percentage change from the baseline in the LDL cholesterol and other lipid parameter, for example, at the week twelve of using uh, 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 Pralwent or alirikumab in addition to lipid lowering therapy, this is uh, the yellow color is the overall overall risk reduction in the LDL, uh, uh, ranging from fifty four percent. To 57 percent, and if you look at the uh, familial hypercholesterolemia patient, heterozygous and non-familial hypercholesterolemia, same results. But of course, uh, as expected, uh, the magnitude of reduction will be more in those without familial hypercholesterolemia. It is not only an uh, effect on the LDL cholesterol. There is some rise in the HDL cholesterol with addition of alirikumab, about 4 percent. The non-HDL cholesterol, which as we uh, discussed in the uh, First presentation uh, that was very important, and there is a significant reduction, more than 45% in all category of patient. Uh, triglycerides is difficult to uh, be reduced only with PSK9 or statin, uh, but we have around seven to eight percent reduction in the uh, triglycerides. So, what is the proportion of patient achieving the predetermined goal? And uh, as you know, the goal. Is this uh, study was uh, less than 70, less than 100, or 50% reduction. And uh, as you see in this uh, diagram, the percentage of patients achieving LDL goal less than 100 in the overall was 74%. This is a very good uh, uh, percentage of patients. In those with heterozygous, it is around 70%. Of course, if there is no family hypercholesterolemia, you can achieve the goal in around... 85% of the patient. That if the goal is 100, if the goal is less than 70, here this the number of uh, goal achievement, 50% overall, 43% 43 in heterozygous, and 62% in those without familial hypercholesterolemia. Of course, the new guidelines now is less than 55, and sometimes less than 40 milligram. We'll see in a while what the percentage in another paper uh, how uh, uh, percentage of patients could be achieved with this very, very low number of LDL cholesterol. Actually, this is a good number because if we look at uh, some numbers when we are not using uh, PSK9 in our country, this is a paper uh, we published about the centralized pan-Middle East survey on the under treatment of hypercholesterolemia. In this paper, of course, there was no PSK9 inhibitor that was in... Uh, uh, 2017, uh, I, I think it was published, uh, only statin therapy. And uh, at that time, the high-risk patients achieving the goal percentage was less than 11%. So that's why I think the addition of these drugs 
uh, will uh, help us a lot in reducing the uh, risk of our uh, patient. And this is uh, uh, results from the study, a praise trial, about the reduction of LDL cholesterol um, uh, uh, um, uh, from the baseline at week 120. And we notice a maintenance of the reduction all over the period of follow-up. And this is whatever the patient is, non-familial hypercholesterolemia, familial heterozygous, and the yellow color is the all uh, group representing all group. So the conclusion was this appraise uh, paper uh, for patients with hypercholesterolemia and the high cardiovascular risk, alurecumab treatment was generally well tolerated and resulting in clinically significant LED in real life. So it seems that in real life uh, usage of PISC-9 inhibitor, uh, we have uh, uh, more than 70% achievement of the goals and we have uh, 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 an important favorable side effect profile that allow us to use this drug on a wide range. Let me uh, uh, share with you another uh, paper in this uh, meeting uh, that was the achievement of this very important paper. Because this paper uh, answer an important question. What if our goal is 55 milligram per deciliter for a very high risk? And what if our goal is 40 milligram per deciliter in those with recurrent uh, 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 cardiovascular event? Uh, how could PISC-9 help in this and what's the percentage of patients achieve their goal? So the background and the aim of this study was uh, trying to answer the questions depending on the ECC, AS guidelines and the new uh, parameters, less than 55 milligram per deciliter uh, uh, in very high risk and less than 40 in those with recurrent cardiovascular event within two years. So trying to ask the questions, what is the percentage of goal achievement when this is our goal? So the method used that, uh, of course, this is uh, 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 analysis of the Odyssey trial. Uh, and uh, as you know, the number of patients used in the Odyssey trial was uh, uh, a huge number of patients were uh, post-acute cholesterol syndrome within the past 12 months. The LDL cholesterol on admission was more than 70, non-HDL cholesterol more than 100, and APOP uh, more than 80 milligram. This is the usual inclusion criteria of the EDIS trial. In this paper, we they determined the number of patients who achieved LDL less than 50 milligram or less than 40 milligram. And another analysis try to uh, answer an important question. What, uh, what is the uh, uh, um, projected uh, uh, number uh, achieved if we add ezetimibe in this situation and whether we uh, can add the uh, PISC-9 at the second step, uh, even before adding azitamibe or not. This is a percentage of patients who achieved LDL less than 55 milligram per deciliter on at least one post-baseline uh, measurement according to the baseline LDL cholesterol. And actually, it is very uh, clear that with the use of PISC-9 in uh, inhibitor, around 94.6% using alurecumab in, in this analysis, achieved the LDL cholesterol if the LDL cholesterol would be less than 50 milligram per deciliter. And this is compared with only less than 18% of the patient could achieve this number if using other lipid-lowering uh, therapy like statin and ezetimibe. What if our goal is less than 40 milligram per deciliter? What is the percentage of patients achieving this goal in the Odyssey trial? Actually, again, uh, this is a good number. It's 84% of patients in Odyssey trial achieve actually this goal of treatment compared to 3.7% when using statin. Uh, so actually, uh, this paper is very important, especially after the uh, new guidelines, after the new number that we have to achieve in our patient, especially those very high risk patient, those with acute cholesterol syndrome. So the conclusion was uh, from this paper that in patients with recent acute cholesterol syndrome and the residual LDL cholesterol elevation, despite intensive or maximum tolerated statin, addition of alirucumab allowed 94, more than 94% to reach a new uh, 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 ESAC goal of less than 55 milligram per deciliter and maybe 84% of the patient can reach the goal 
of 40 milligram per deciliter. And actually, uh, uh, I lead a, a group of experts uh, and published a recent paper, uh, our review about narrative review and expert panel recommendation on dyslipidemia management after acute chronic syndrome in countries outside Western Europe and North America. And of course, the situation, uh, real world situation outside the USA and Western Europe is not like the situation we discussed in these uh, uh, papers because the use of uh, risk 9 inhibitor is uh, actually uh, not on a wide range uh, because of uh, cost effective issues, because of reimbursement issues with uh, insurance uh, systems in this country. In this paper, actually, we review observational study uh, in 28 countries. Uh, uh, around 300 articles were, were reviewed, from which 68 articles met uh, our criteria to be included in this paper. And one of the uh, 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 paper we used to, uh, in, in our review was uh, uh, this uh, trial I referred earlier, which is the CFIAS uh, trials, showing that, as I told you, less than 11% of the patient at very high risk reach the treatment goal, and this is mandate the need of more aggressive lipid lowering therapy, more combination therapy, and maybe more wide use of PISC-9 inhibitor, especially in those with very high risk patients, especially with those post-acute coronary syndrome patients. We also um, published a paper about the percentage of patients with premature atherosclerosis in a sample of Egyptian patients with acute coronary syndrome. And a lot of our patients at, at a younger age uh, uh, actually, uh, according to the definition of premature acid sclerosis, 47% of our Egyptian males and 69% of Egyptian females are considered by definition premature acid sclerosis. And you know that uh, half of them may be heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, which is difficult to treat with the ordinary uh, therapy, statin, and combinations, and may uh, need PISC-9 in higher percentage of these uh, patients. So uh, that's why we published recently uh, uh, the Yava consensus on the usage of PISC-9 inhibitor uh, in Egyptian patients. And of course, because of cost uh, effectiveness, we uh, uh, highlight uh, the importance of use it in the very high risk population. Uh, by definition, those with atherosclerotic ischemic heart disease, those with familial hypercholesterolemia and risk factors, and we advocate the starting with maximum high intensity statin, followed by zetimibe, and if not at goal or not tolerated, adding PISC-9 inhibitor in the very highest. Of course, as Dr. Dirk Fay uh, said, that we, if we allow, if you are allowed, and if the drug is cheap, we will give him to anybody who could not achieve the predetermined goal for his risk category with statin therapy and combination. So by the end of this presentation, I can conclude that cardiovascular protection in high risk and acute coronary syndrome patient is still not well addressed. Uh, the recent guidelines and the low, very low numbers of go, uh, goals should be achieved, which is less than 55 milligram for very high risk or even less than 40 milligram for those with recurrent cardiovascular event, uh, uh, highlight the importance of using more combination therapy and maybe the need for PISC-9 inhibitors. Statin with or without ezetimibe may not be enough in many patient subsets. And recent real-world alorectomab uh, uh, data showed goal achievement in a great majority of patients, more than 90% maybe, could achieve this very low number. However, the cost effectiveness in our region may require more focus on the very high-risk groups, for example, post-acute coronary syndrome, heterozygous with multiple risk factors, premature atherosclerosis and statin intolerance. Thank you. I will let the stage, Dr. Atif, if there is any questions. Thank you very much, Ashraf, for your lecture. And if any question from my friends for Ashraf, you can ask. So we come to the end. Any questions? Yes or no? Thank you. Okay, Dr. thank you. I hope I will be with Dr. Selim in this uh, nice place. He's, uh, what is the place, uh, Selim? <laughs> My home. <laughs> My home, Dr. Ashraf. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you, uh, dear colleagues, dear friends. I am appreciated for all of you.
for the exciting knowledge and discussion and the ideas, new ideas in managing this lipidemia in this uh, lipid summit. Thank you very much, dear Andrea, and hope to see you in real life soon. And thank you, Derek, to see you in real life. I, I, I really appreciate it. And this is not the, will be the first time, it will be next time more and more. And thank you, Ashraf, Ihab, Nabil, Sayed, Farag, Hani, Ragi, Ahmed, Salim. And, and thanks for Sanofi for the sponsorship and uh, the uh, media factory for ICOM company team who make <coughs> this is and possible Abbott, for us. Sanofi and Abbott, I want special thank for uh, yes. Sanofi and Abbott for their continuous support yes. to our CME activity and hope to see you uh, uh, soon. Thank you, all of you. And thank you all. Have thank a nice time. Enjoy. Be safe. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you.